Well, thank you, worship team, for leading us today. Good morning, friends. It's a joy to be with you all again after having a break for the last couple of weeks. And this morning, we have the great privilege of going back to the Old Testament and beginning a study in one of my favorite books of the, New Test- of the Old Testament. Perhaps some of you have um, also read the wonderful book of Nehemiah, but one of the great heroes of the Old Testament whose life has much to teach us in terms of heart for God's people, for working for God's people, for, uh, for the things that, um, that burden the heart of God that he shares with us and invites us to do in his work. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah to the book of Nehemiah. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, we invite you to grab one of the pew Bibles sitting there in front of you, and you'll find Nehemiah chapter 1 on page 370, 370. If you brought a Bible with you and you're still finding your addresses and not quite sure where Nehemiah is, the easiest way to find it is just take your Bible and just open up to the middle. And my guess is you'll either be in Isaiah, maybe Jeremiah, or perhaps one of the Psalms, And if that's the case, just start backing up and you'll hit Nehemiah very quickly. Nehemiah comes just before the major prophets and the the wisdom literature, the Proverbs and Psalms and whatnot. And that's the simple way to find where Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah is. Well, friends, many of you have probably heard this quote before if you've been in ministry circles for, uh, for any length of time, and some of you might even support the organization to where this quote comes from. Um, but Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, so some of you have heard of World Vision, a great, uh, great ministry that works with needy uh, children in particular and, and the poor around the world. He said this, that my heart, he said, this is a prayer he prayed to God that led him to founding World Vision. He said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Now, I've heard this quote in in various variations over the years, and I understand the, the sentiment of it, and I agree with the sentiment of it, but the language has always been a little bit problematic for me because I tend to be kind of anal about the Bible and things being biblical and lining up. And I just, I've not found a place where I can see in Scripture where God's heart is, is broken, specifically. Now, I understand that what, what, what Bob Pierce is trying to say here, but I've always struggled with the, the language of God with a broken heart. It sounds too much, maybe I just grew up in the, you know, the 80s and 90s when all, it was all romance music and broken hearted stuff. Maybe I'm just too jaded by the music I grew up with, but the idea of God having a broken heart sounds too much like our own vernacular. However, I think what this, ver- this quote is trying to capture does have some validity to it for us to consider. So I want to rephrase the language to what I think actually lines up more with what the scripture teaches, but get to the same point. Rather than think of God having a broken heart and us needing to have our hearts broken for the things that break his, what about burden? What is God burdened for? And how does God put a burden on our hearts for the things that burden his? Now, by definition, a burden is something that is difficult or unpleasant that you have to deal with or worry about. So many of us carry burdens for our families. Many of us carry burdens for uh, perhaps our financial situation or a job situation or uh, friends or neighbors who are struggling or going through something difficult. And there's something that grieves our hearts and we feel a heaviness for that specific thing. That is, that is a burden. What we find in the Bible is there's heaviness, burdens that God carries Things that burden him that are unpleasant that he sees amongst his creation that he wants to do something about. So I looked up the definition for a spiritual burden, and here's what, 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 Reiner, what, one, ah, what one writer said. A spiritual burden is this, a spiritual weight placed on one's heart, usually because God wants their attention. I think this is important. God wants their attention focused on a certain matter. That God will put burdens, a weight placed on the hearts of his people when he wants them to pay attention or do something about a certain matter. And that certain matter is always something that God is burdened for. That God wants to get done. That God wants to see happen. And he uses his servants, his people, to accomplish it. 
Now, friends, this is a great segue now into the book of Nehemiah. And what we're going to find with this, this leader that God is going to raise up to restore the walls around Jerusalem, because this is exactly what happens to Nehemiah. God gives him a burden and a calling to, to go and accomplish something on God's behalf for the good of God's people. So as we begin our journey now throughout this book of Nehemiah, we're going to see a man who is broken, broken and grieved over the spiritual condition of God's people and how he goes about to set things right under God's care and God's providence. And we're going to find with Nehemiah, there's many rich practical lessons for us in our day to see the broken proverbial walls of our day being restored as as we respond to God's call to go and to be about his business, carrying his burdens and accomplishing his work under his power for his glory. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we ask that now as we start our journey through this uh, this rich story that you've given us inspired by your holy word that actually happened in history under this leader called Nehemiah, that you would now be our instructor and teach us how you want us to share your burdens for our day today. So Father, we pray that as we study the example of Nehemiah, that you would put burdens on our hearts for the work you want to have accomplished here in our community, in our place, in our world, and how you want to have us be about your interests for your glory. So lead us now throughout the study, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, in order to understand the full context of Nehemiah, why the walls are broken down, why this was even uh, happening, we have to do a little bit of historical work. So for those of you here who maybe aren't real familiar with the Old Testament, maybe you don't know all the Old Testament stories, um, perhaps you've never even heard of Nehemiah, I want to give you some context so you can understand uh, what we're going to be getting into. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses makes a prediction. Moses makes a prediction that is really grounded in a future prophecy about God's people. Now, if you're not familiar with the name Moses, Moses is the one who led um, God's people out of slavery in Egypt and had brought them to the very brink of the promised land. And then, of course, the, 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 um, uh, his leadership passed on to Joshua, and Joshua is the one that brought them into the promised land and where they established their nation that we today call Israel. Before Moses died... He called the people together, and he reminded them of God's covenant with them. And he said, if you follow God's commandments, you will be blessed. And if you reject God's commandments, then you will be cursed. And one of the curses that Moses predicted would happen if people did not follow God's commandments is that they would again be taken out of the land, that a foreign nation would come, invade, destroy all of their community, and bring them as slaves into their own land. So they, it's almost like going back to Egypt. They become slaves to a foreign nation once again. And at the end of Deuteronomy 29, Moses basically says, yeah, this is going to happen. He doesn't just warn them that this could happen. He basically says, you're stiff-necked people, and this is what your future generations are going to be. So the end of 29 is a little bit depressing. However, in chapter 30, Moses says these words. And when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. He says, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. In other words, he says, one day when your future generations are sitting in exile, they're going to remember the covenant. They're going to remember that they were supposed to obey God. They're going to remember the blessings and curses that Moses had predicted would happen. And they would turn to God. And seek him with all their heart and find him again and God would restore them back into the land. He would take them out of their place of slavery and move them back into their land and restore them. In other words, God would be merciful to them again. And God would be gracious and God would restore all of their fortunes. So, this actually happens. 
everything Moses predicted is carried out later on in Israel's history. So I'm going to give you some dates and give you some events so you can see where Nehemiah actually falls in biblical history. So in 586, the Jews were taken into exile. Those that were, remained in Jerusalem, the tribe, uh, the tribe of Judah and part of another tribe, they were actually the last ones that were taken into exile by uh, the Babylonians. So when you read the book of Daniel, for example, that's, uh, that is God's people under Babylonian captivity under exile. However, a miracle happens in 539. Cyrus, the king of Persia, defeats Babylon, establishes the great Persian empire. Then in 538, he makes a decree to let the Jews come back to their homeland. So again, under the mercy of this pagan ruler, God moves his people out of their exodus and back into their land, out of their exile, back into their land. Now, in 516, the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonian army is rebuilt under the guidance of Zerubbabel and Yeshua. In 458, Ezra, the priest, goes to Jerusalem to help spiritually lead the community. So if you read the book of Ezra, that's Ezra going back, trying to help them get worship going again now that the temple has been established. So now we come to 445. So this is almost a hundred years after they've been led back into their uh, led back into the land, and this is the condition of God's people that Nehemiah encounters, and why he gets this burden for his, the welfare of the people and for restoring the walls surrounding Jerusalem. So let's turn our attention here to chapter one, verse one, and begin where Nehemiah records for us his story and what God had led him to. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, of Chil, uh, I think I got this right, Chislev, if I got, yeah, those of you who know Hebrew better than me can correct me on this. In that 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is still technically in exile. He's there serving the king, as we'll see, in the capital of Persia. And he has, his brother comes along with some others of, uh, from Judah, and he says, how are things going in Jerusalem? How are, how are the, the exiles doing now that they're back in the land? And he's anticipating to hear good things because he knows what Mo Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 30. He knows Moses predicted that they'd be restored to the land and worship would start again and God would be faithful to his promises. He's looking for good news, but here's what he hears instead. Verse three, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. In other words, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. It's almost as if the Babylonians had just been there yesterday. The condition of the people is that bad. Yeah, the temple's been rebuilt, but the walls surrounding the community are still broken down and as if they were destroyed by fire by the Babylonian army just the other day. In other words, for almost a whole generation, nothing has changed. Now, you may think, well, all right, is it really that big of a deal? The foreign armies weren't anywhere nearby. Uh, the walls have been broken down for almost 100 years. Is it really that big of a deal? At least they got the temple. But to Nehemiah, this was a big deal because the walls were supposed to be the protection for the city. The walls were what kept enemies out. And the walls were also a symptom of the spiritual condition of the people. So when Nehemiah hears this news... He doesn't just simply hear, hey, the walls need to be restored. He hears that, oh, the people have fallen into great shame. The people have fallen into apathy. The people have stopped believing what God had promised according to Moses. They're not taking action. They're vulnerable. Nehemiah is concerned about the future existence of the nation as a whole. And he's thinking to himself, do they not know the trouble they're in? Do they not see the poor spiritual condition they're in? Do they not know what God has promised and planned for them? Has nobody told them? So in verse 4, Nehemiah records that as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept 
and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah receives his burden, broken, brokenhearted for the condition of God's people. This is what he prays, verse 5. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your ears open to the, to the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Now, there's lots of stuff here in this prayer that we need to, to unpack together to really get the heart of what Nehemiah is asking for in this prayer. Notice, first and foremost, Nehemiah speaks about God's character. He appeals to God's character. He refers to God as the all-powerful, all good, awesome, great creator, Lord of all. When you pray to God and you're interceding for people and you have a burden for something, remember first and foremost to whom we are praying to. Pray God's character to him. Tell God who he is. Remind him who he is and what he has promised. Now, when we do this, we're not actually reminding God as if he's forgotten. We're reminding ourselves of who he is. We're reminding ourselves of who he is. When we pray and pray according to God's character, God invites us to call upon him as the all-powerful, all-good, awesome, faithful one. Now, the second thing Nehemiah does is he not only appeals to God's character, but he appeals to God's covenant. If you look back at the prayer that we just said, you see echoes of Deuteronomy 30 there. Echoes of the words of Moses. What Nehemiah is doing is he's praying back to God, not only his attributes and his character, but he's praying back to God the covenant that God had made. And he says, Lord... You are the God who called your people, who redeemed them with your mighty hand. You are the one who made these promises to them. And then Nehemiah says, I've sinned. My house have sinned. Our people have sinned against you. But you, O oh God, are good and merciful, the God of steadfast love. And you've made these promises that if your people would turn to you and repent, you would restore them. Friends, this prayer is so rich and full of instruction for us. I hope you don't pass over this too quickly as you do your own study through Nehemiah. Because God invites us to pray the exact same way today. He invites us to pray the exact same way today. According to his character and according to his covenant that he's ultimately fulfilled in the name of the Lord Jesus that's why we pray in the name of Jesus, because Jesus is the one who ultimately fulfills all the covenant promises of God for us. So as you pray to the Lord, remind yourself of his character. Remind yourself of his covenant and what he's promised to you in the name, signed and sealed by the blood of Jesus. Now, Nehemiah is not done yet. He doesn't just simply pray to God and ask for God to do something about it, in verse 11, Nehemiah asks God to let him do something about it. Look what he says, verse 9, verse 11. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. End of prayer. So the question is, who's he talking about? 
What does he mean when he asks for favor and today in front of this man? Who is he talking about? Well, Nehemiah tells us here at the very end of verse 11, Nehemiah says, Now I was cupbearer to the king. So for those of you who are like, well, who's the king and what is a cupbearer? Um, this is important information that Nehemiah is recording for us. Nehemiah is employed by the king of Persia. Not Cyrus, but the following king that comes around this time that Nehemiah was alive. And this king, again, following Cyrus's edicts, had favor on Jerusalem and on the Jews and was allowing people to go back into the land. Now, Nehemiah is employed by the king as a cup bearer, which means that you have to be someone that the king really likes and someone that the king could easily dispose of if needs be. So it's a very precarious place to be. So the cupbearer technically is a person that tests all of the king's food and drink to make sure it's not poisoned, to make sure that one of the, one of the king's enemies hasn't poisoned the food. So to be, again, to be in the presence of the king, he's got to like you and trust you, but if something were to happen to you, then that's okay, get the next cupbearer in in line. So the cupbearer, the king, you know, imagine this, he he gets, you know, knock, knock, here's the servant with all the great food, he's got his, you know, his chicken dinner and his big goblet of wine, and uh, Nehemiah comes up, and the king says, Nehemiah, so glad you're here, eat and drink, test it for me. So Nehemiah takes by the chicken, nothing happened, big gulp of wine, okay, I'm still alive. Okay, the food is good. The king can go ahead and eat it. If Nehemiah falls over dead, then you know, ah, that meal isn't so good. Next cup bear, next meal. So that's Nehemiah's role. Now, the reason Nehemiah tells us this is because he believes that he has some level of trust and favor with the king, and he's asking God, he's asking God for God to give him even more favor with the king in order to do something about these broken walls. And we're going to find out what those things are here in chapter 2, and we get to that next week, about specifically how Nehemiah goes about uh, volunteering himself to go on God's behalf, carrying God's burden, sharing God's burden to restore these broken walls that they see all around Jerusalem. But for right now, what I want us to do is just think about what we've seen so far with the prayer that Nehemiah gives, the reason that he is praying it, and the burden that God is calling him to share. So here's our main idea. God invites his people to share his burden for the spiritual welfare of his church by calling them to lament, confess, pray, and go on his behalf. God invites his people to share his burdens for the spiritual welfare of his church by calling them to lament, confess, pray, and go on his behalf. So what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for us today? What does it look like for us to share God's burdens for the proverbial broken walls of our day and to respond the way that Nehemiah did? So what I want to do is just look at, look at Nehemiah's prayer that we just went through and break it down into the steps that I just laid out in the main idea and suggest to you that the process that Nehemiah went through is one that we can go through as well as we seek to be faithful to what God may be calling us to. However, there is a caveat to all of this. Nehemiah was really grieved by the spiritual condition of God's people. Nehemiah really cared about the condition of God's people. Nehemiah was a man who had a one-track mind, a one-track mind for the burden that that God gave him to restore the glory of Jerusalem according to what Moses had predicted it was supposed to be. To see God's people fully repent and turn back to God, that God may be glorified in the land again. In other words, Nehemiah was genuinely interested in the things that God was interested in. The question is, are we? Are we? Now, I think one of the most haunting verses in all the New Testament comes out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. I'll put them up here on the screen for you. This is the Apostle Paul 
writing to the Philippian church, describing his relationship with his young protege, Timothy. Now, if you remember from our study in the book of Acts that we just completed a couple of months ago, Timothy was Paul's right-hand person. And Paul and Timothy went through many adventures together in the book of Acts. Later on, um, when Paul was imprisoned, he was appealing for Timothy to come and visit him. And in this case, in, the, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is saying that he's going to send Timothy to the Philippians to encourage them because Paul himself can't go due to his current imprisonment. But this is what he says in verse 20 of chapter 2 of Philippians. He says, I have no one like Timothy who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, I've got no one else like Timothy who I can trust to do this task I'm going to give him because he really cares about you. He really cares about your spiritual welfare. And the reason he does is because he wants what Jesus wants. Everyone else is doing their own thing, but Timothy, he's different. He really cares about what Jesus cares about. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 whenever I come to this passage, it's, it's like I'm flinching. Ah, ugh, there it is. Because it's an indictment, right? Against the distractions in my life and in your life too. Friends, what is distracting you from focusing on the things that God wants you to focus on, the interests of Jesus. And if we ask the, question, ask the question, what is it that interested Jesus most? Well, we have it there in verse 20. It's the welfare of God's people, the thing that burdened Nehemiah. So before we can talk about following God's call or having God's burden, we need to first and foremost check our own hearts and ask the question, are we burdened and interested in the things that interest the Lord Jesus, are we really concerned about the welfare of God's people? And if you're like me, and your welfare for God's people is something you aspire to and want, but know the, the battles you have in your own heart against your own distractions and the things that, that, that collide with that, um, you're in good company. I'm right there with you. But, but here's, I want to lay out just simply a, a process for you that we see in Nehemiah about how we can reorient our hearts and our minds around the things that God is most concerned about. So, Here's how we can share in God's burdens and listen to his voice and follow his call for our lives and, and do our part and what God may be calling us to do to see to it that the welfare of God's people is being cared for through our unique personality and our unique gifting. The first thing we see Nehemiah do is he laments. He laments. He hears the news about Jerusalem he hears the news about the condition of God's, of God's people and the walls being broken down, and it breaks him. He weeps, he fasts, and he begins to pray. He's lamenting. Now, for those of you that don't know what that word means, lament isn't, isn't just simply feel bad about it or think, ah, shucks, you know, bummer. It's, lament is actually a deep sense of, of grieving over the condition of God's people. In the Psalms, you see Psalms that are laments, where David and the other Psalm writers are crying out to God about the things that are oppressing God's people, the circumstances they are in. Lament means it is a deep sense of, of grief and sorrow over the things that God is grieved over. It's being burdened by the things that God is burdened with. And lamenting is, is part of our discipleship. Our discipleship is join the Lord, yes, but there's also lament a time and space for, for grief and for sorrow and for crying out to God. So Nehemiah begins by lamenting the condition of God's people. And friends, I want to suggest to you that I don't think we see enough lamenting today in the evangelical church. What I think we see today in the evangelical church, not this church in particular, but just and broadly in the church in America with conservative evangelicals, is a lot of complaining, complaining. Okay, complaining is the equivalent of the old guy on his porch yelling at kids to get off his lawn, right? That's complaining. Lamenting means being grieved, deeply grieved by the spiritual condition of the church. Grieved to the point that you actually move to the next phase, which is confess. Confess. Notice when Nehemiah prayed his prayer, he wasn't just praying about 
those lazy people in Jerusalem, those slackers in Jerusalem, those people who are not concerned about what God is concerned about and letting the walls stay torn down and stay broken. No, what you find with Nehemiah's lament and confession is he includes himself. He says, Lord, we have sinned. I and my house have sinned. The sins and failings of the people in Jerusalem and your people in history, these are my failings too. These are my failings too. These are my family's failings. And I think what we need to see in our day is Christians who are lamenting and confessing and taking the failings of the church and of other Christians and of other ministries as their own, rather than casting judgment and casting, casting rocks at those that, that, are, that are failing. So I learned this lesson as a young pastor. As a young pastor, I was always very critical, very judgmental anytime I would hear about moral failings of other leaders. And then someone I was very close to had a moral failing. And I saw it up close. And suddenly all of my, you know, young 20-something, I know what's best for the world, criticism fell apart. And I grieved. I grieved and I realized that this person who had been a spiritual hero to me that I was close to and thought a lot of and watching him go through his moral failings, I realized that could be me in 10 years. That could be me. His failings were my failings. And I lamented, confessed, and grieved. Not that I excused the actions, but realized that it is by, by the grace of God that we all go. And it's by the grace of God that we're going to be sustained confessing, lamenting, sharing the burdens, the failings of those also around us, realizing that no one is superior. It's only by the grace of God that any of us get through anything. And then Nehemiah prays. He prays and he pleads God's character. He pleads God's covenant. And then he says, Lord, I will go. I'm not just going to complain about it. I'm not just going to grieve it. I'm not just going to pray for it. I'm going to go and do something about it. And so we'll see next week that Nehemiah sets himself up to actually take the risk of going to Jerusalem and seeing for himself what's happening and stirring the people up that we've got to do this. We've got to restore these walls. Nehemiah prays and Nehemiah ultimately goes. Are we willing to do the same thing? Are we willing to do the same thing? Now, there may be circumstances in which going is not practical or going is, is not able to, to actually happen and, and therefore all you can do is simply pray and that's okay. God invites us to pray for the needs of his church and the needs of his people and he hears our prayers even when we aren't able to actually go ourselves. But where can you go? What could you do? How has God uniquely wired you, uniquely gifted you, in such a way that the world's deep need and your burden, your desires could actually somehow intersect and meet? Where can you go? What can you do? Again, friends, there's lots of work to be done in, in the church today. There's lots of proverbial walls that have been broken down in the American church today. What are you burdened for? What do you want to see? What are you praying to God about? What are you asking him for? And what are you willing to do? I'll just share a couple of examples uh, from my own life and how this has worked out for me. One commitment that I've had since I was, you know, early on in ministry, is that I never wanted to be someone that was complaining about youth and the youth generation, the generations coming up behind me. I didn't want to be, again, the old guy on the porch yelling everybody to get off his lawn. I didn't want to do that. I, all around me, I heard people always complaining about this generation and this generation and this generation. And they used to complain about me when I was in high school. I'm a Gen Xer, and they had a lot of negative things to say about Gen Xers. So part of me got a little cynical hearing people always complaining about youth a little bit from my growing up years. But really, I just, I would hear people all the time lamenting 
and grieving how bad the youth are, how lost the youth are, how worried about the youth are, they are. I had people in my church used to say to me, I feel sorry for people who are having kids in this generation because I wouldn't want to be a parent in this generation. And so friends, I decided that I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to do something about it. I'm never going to complain. I mean, you'll, you won't hear me ever. I'll critique things. I'll have things to say about generations. But I'm never going to complain and not do something about it. You won't hear me complain about our youth ever. I've got high hope for our youth. I see God doing amazing things in our youth. And so I became a youth pastor at a young age and really was not very good at it. Um, I'm not gifted like... Pastor Michael and Jacob and Claire, like I'm, I'm not good at youth ministry, but I have a burden and heart for youth, and so I do what I can to help out. So though my, my years of youth pastor weren't, uh, uh, they were very sanctifying, I'll just put it that way. Um, all throughout my ministry, in every place I've gone, I've always tried to be involved with youth in some form or fashion in some way. I'm raising teenagers myself. I have a youth group here because I believe very much in blessing and teaching and encouraging the next generation. And you're going to hear something on September 22nd from um, our students that went on the, on the mission trip that Jacob was just talking about and two of my kids got to go. And you're going to hear amazing things. And you're going to be encouraged about the future of our church and the future of our youth don't just complain about it, do something about it. But the deeper burden that I've had since I became a believer as a teenager is that people would know the word of God, is that people would know the word of God. And so I gave my life to teaching the Bible. And the reason I do what I do now is because I have a deep burden for people to know his word. And so that's led me to everywhere I've been and what I'm doing currently. Because deep down, at the very core of my being, I want you to know Jesus and I want you to know his word. That is my burden. Now, some of you may have other burdens. God may touch you with other things that he wants to see get done in this world and is calling you and has given you the opportunity and the gifts to do it. What's holding you back? What's keeping you from it? What distractions or clutter have gotten in the way of your spiritual vision that, that need to be cleared out that you may be available to what God may be calling you to? And it may be little, it may be much, I don't know. But each of you, if you're following the Lord Jesus, have been given spiritual gifts and have been given a place in the body to make a contribution to the welfare of God's people. And what we're going to see in Nehemiah is that when God's people come together and have a specific focus and are committed to the same goal, God, God is able to accomplish much. So friends, our prayer and our vision for this church is that Christ may be seen by all. That Christ may be seen by all. And throughout this series, my hope is that our study in Nehemiah will solidify and unify us in that vision that whatever individual callings we may have, that we together as a church body are pointing all people back to Jesus, that in our daily lives and in our corporate worship and in our witness and in sending our missionaries to other parts of the world, that Christ would be seen by all. That is the burden of our eldership and that's the burden of this church and has been for generations and that is my burden as your pastor to see us all united around that key central thing. So as you prepare to go to prayer this morning, and as we prepare to leave from this place and be sent back out into the world around us, I want to encourage you to spend time with the Lord this week. To spend time with the Lord this week, asking him for what his burden is and for what your part is in sharing that and going to be his hands and feet to the people that he's wanting you to point back to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as we go from this place, having seen the example of Nehemiah and the way that you shaped him and used him to go and rebuild the walls, that you would put a burden on our hearts for what you're calling us to do, for what our unique place might be in your kingdom and in your church to help restore your people, 
to encourage your people, to renew your people. So even now, Lord, we pray that you would bring people to mind, bring circumstances to our minds now. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would guide our steps as a church, that we could be a people who point others to you, that you may be seen by all. So Lord, use us in our own unique personalities, gifts, circumstances, and keep us from distractions that we may be interested in the things that you were interested in, caring and sharing your burden and pointing others back to you. So Lord Jesus, we ask all of this in your mighty name. And together God's people said,